Thank you. Uh, so I will be talking to today. <laughs> Sorry about that. So okay, I, I, I will be talking today about um, one apparent contradiction, or let's say a conflict, when you are trying to create uh, video games uh, to promote archaeology. And in this context, I, will, I want to talk about this conflict between education or fun. So I will start with that, then I will uh, discuss a third approach called learning by design, and I will discuss that in two different case studies. It's a very if you want an empirical uh, presentation because I will be talking about the lessons we learned and the issues we had and some of the positive aspects that we got from these two different uh, projects we developed. So uh, I want to start with this idea of education versus in, in entertainment or fun if you want to. Um, if you start with this idea of entertainment, how the past is seen, let's say, in commercial products that want to make a profit, um, usually they use the past for I mean, there is a variety of reasons, but usually they use it because it's kind of a free franchise. So on the one hand, the audience know, knows the past, so they know what is wrong, they know who is Julius Caesar. They, uh, it's like, you don't need to start from scratch, you don't need to create a universe. The other thing is that it's free. You don't have to pay a license, it's on Marvel. So you're using a background, and in this background you can do whatever you want, you have some connections to the audience already, and they may be interested already. Um, in this context, which is free, uh, they use a lot of stereotypes or tropes because that's what uh, it will resonate with the audience. So uh, on top of that, you have this idea of mystery, of the epics of the past, of finding a new adventure, a new civilization, which resonates again with this idea of Indiana Jones or, if you want to, uh, Lara Croft, Tomb, Tomb Raider, or Uncharted, or even uh, games where you don't have like real past, but you have a, a ruined civilization that you can explore, such as in this case, The Last Guardian. So one thing that we have to be aware of is that if we are using these games to try to teach about the past, then we have to be aware that this is the context where they were created and these are the reasons, some of the reasons why they used the past in their games. On the other hand, you have education. And in education, one of the big issues is that for very obvious reasons, if you play some of these games, they are associated with just boring stuff that you should not be playing, okay? Because they are not seen as games. This is a problem, and the re one of the reasons is that lots of these games are based on exposition. So it's just text, 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 and maybe some game mechanics unrelated to the text and some images. So it's kind of a course book translated into something kind of interactive. Um, the other thing is that if you use these games in a classroom, uh, they are not a playful experience anymore. So you are losing part of the interest of the game itself. Uh, because uh, they are not learning the game. Uh, you are forcing them to learn, which is a different thing. Uh, one example of that, which is kind of interesting to me at least, is this. Uh, when Assassin's Creed released this discovery tool, which is like an educational tool, uh, they remove all the fun part of the game. So all the game mechanics are not there, and it's just a passive guided visit through the scenarios of the game. Which is like, but I mean, why would you do that? This is a game, so keep, keep doing a game, right? So you have these two apparently conflictive uh, situations. And if you try to do something different, it's very difficult. So imagine that you say, I will create a game, and this game will be educational, but uh, I don't want to use it in formal context. I just want to put the game there so people play it if they want to. The problem here is that then you are competing for time, for the time of the player, right? And you are competing against free games where they can play with their friends, such as Fortnite. Uh, but also you are competing with $200 million projects. So what, so on, in what universe they will play your game instead of Red Dead Redemption? <laughs> um, th the thing is that it's not that simple because you have lots of games that they, that you can learn something, uh, such as Papers, Please, which is kind of a game about bureaucracy in a Soviet-inspired republic. People will pay that, and th this can become like a huge success in indie context. Okay, or Celeste, a game that is a platformer but is really about depression. And people will learn about depression playing these games. And these are very successful games. So the idea here is that if you integrate learning in game design, then this could be something worth exploring. This can be something successful that brings a lot of audience. The reason behind that is that you have a set of characteristics of games that are very appealing for learning, things like agency, interactivity, problem solving, nonlinear narratives, learning. And the central piece is that any game is a puzzle, and you have to learn how to beat the puzzle. So if you have to learn to play a game, why can't you use this learning to actually do something interesting? And that's what we try to do with these two case studies. <clears throat> the fifth one is called Evolving Planet. 
And uh, the idea here is that we had this project called Simulpass. It was a project about simulation in archaeology, so not mainstream, not really mainstream archaeology. And we wanted to explain that. Um, what we did here is, uh, th this is what you get. This is the output from simulations in archaeology. So it's not really appealing if you want to think about impact of outreach. So what we think is, OK, let's do something different here. Let's create a video game that uses simulation to learn about the past. And we base that on the idea of science fiction. Uh, science fiction is like a field of ideas. So if we can get some of these ideas, maybe we can teach something about archaeology, in this case, in a different planet. So in this game, you arrive to some place where a, a kind of a hominin uh, alien species was uh, extinguished, and you need to use archaeology and simulation to actually learn what happened there and why did they become extinct. So that's the central idea of the game. Um, the requirements for that, we decided to go from 14 years onwards. This is kind of a tricky thing, because when you're playing, uh, when you're thinking about creating a video game that you will put up there, uh, you will upload to some digital um, platform, you can't really know who is going to play that. And it's not as, let's say, organized as books, where you have 12 to 14, 14 to whatever. So we decided at least 14, but also if someone is interested in strategy games, they can play the game. Um, we were a small <coughs> development team, part-time, three to five people, a uh, small project. Uh, you see, well, it's, it's a small for games. It's kind of middle or uh, big for uh, academia, I guess, for 70,000 euros. <coughs> and the idea is that we wanted to develop this game for tablets and smartphones so everybody can play them if they have access to this technology. In terms of game mechanics, um, it's a strategy game. So uh, you go through 20 different missions, and each mission there's some kind of goal. And we start at the how many dispersion you are trying to simulate what happened there and try to learn from this uh, and go to the next mission until you finish with the Olympic transition, climate change, stuff like that. Let me show you uh, the teaser trailer for this game, if that works, I hope. OK. Here because I don't have that much time. But uh, you can see that the feeling, this idea of uh, mystery here, but then we used a different setting just because then uh, you have more playground if you want to explain different ideas, and then you can go for parallels if you want to about what happened with the uh, with Planet Earth. So this is the impact. We had around uh, 120,000 downloads. I don't admit on why uh, this stopped at 2018. And we kind of demonstrated that this is a viable approach with a reasonable budget. You can actually create something that people is willing to download and play. Uh, we got decent reviews and lots of feedback, particularly from teachers that were using them in class. So that, I guess, is kind of a success. But uh, we learned some things. People is not playing with tablets. People always play with phones. And we designed that for tablets. So it's a kind of a, no, that is a mistake with it. Um, also. General media publish quite a lot of newspapers, uh, of news in Spain about that, but they don't have any impact on download. So either it's gaming websites and don't bother. And the other thing is that you are completely powerless when it comes to publishing. So you publish it in Google Play, Apple Store, and they will do anything with that. You don't know why uh, you get more or less downloads because you don't know the algorithms. And it can happen something like that, where after a couple of years, they suspended the game because they say it was pornography. We try to reason that they are prehistoric people, so sorry, some of time, sometimes they are naked. No, they <laughs> suspended that. And because of this image, um, they said they were particularly offended against uh, for, for the um, uh, male, instead of the women, I don't know why. 
Um, so yeah, they suspended the game, and the game now cannot be downloaded or played in Google Play. So it's kind of a very random. So you find some guy that is offended by the game, and then uh, you don't have any way of re arguing about that. Let's go to the second one. Uh, in this one, it's about the Papuerca. It's one of the most important archaeological sites in Europe. And they wanted uh, us to create a video game exploring uh, different hominins and the difference in technologies, landscape, culture, etc. So the idea is that uh, we also wanted to show recent trends in uh, research, but also breaking some of the stereotypes. Things like you can see in all games, such as uh, you don't see kids, you don't see old people, women are for gathering, and uh, men are the ones hunting, all these things that we wanted to break, let's say. So it's a site for younger audience, uh, way smaller. It works with me coding and another person uh, working on the artwork, and both of us were working part time. Uh, but with the lessons we learned from the previous project, we thought that we could actually put this out. So that's the idea. It's a simulation game. You, uh, you are playing with a group of uh, hunter gatherers from different periods, from you, using the different human groups. And uh, the idea here, as you can see, is already for foam, so it's vertical. Uh, you start with a story reinforcing oral tradition from a Bronze Age elder. Uh, this is based on actually a painting in a cave uh, near Atapuerca, so that is the idea. Um, game mechanics are about different goals, so you have different actions, kind of yeah, things that you can do, uh, or things that uh, Paleolithic people were uh, doing in their li daily life, and based on that we created this slightly different, uh, less realistic artwork, and we went uh, with that. Um, these are some examples. One interesting bit is that people, when we did some tests with uh, high school students, they really wanted uh, hunting to be a mini game because that is what happened in lots of games. <laughs> so we actually said, oh, let, let's, let's go for it. And we created a mini game for the activity of hunting, which uh, is valued as the most interesting bit of the whole thing, which, okay, <laughs> let's say that uh, it's, not, uh, it's not surprising, but at the same time, it's good to think about this uh, thing. Again, I have a video. I will just show some a bit of it because I don't have a lot of time. But... So that's the time we wanted to look for like well, If you want to see the whole thing is on the internet, so feel free to check it later. Mm -hmm. But here the idea was that we have this idea that past people are kind of inferior somehow. So we are giving this message like, can you actually do what they did? Okay. So that's what we are uh, we were looking forward. So the impact was better at the level of reviews, at the level of media, but you can see here how for iOS, we got more or less the same, 40, 50,000 downloads. For Android, we don't know what happened there. So we have a very low impact in Android, and we don't know why. And that is one of the issues when I was talking that you are powerless here, is because you don't really understand what's going on. And this is very bad because it's very difficult to get feedback from that. Uh, so lessons here, we think that the background or the landscape of mobile gaming has changed. And in this sense, free games are not interesting anymore. And indie games are not interesting anymore because people are just playing free, huge games uh, that are designed to just capture your money, I guess. And very ca casual in the sense that they are just something that you are playing with. You're on the tube and you don't really want to think about what's going on. So um, these are some of the things that we are thinking right now about what to do. Things like, do we need to change from free to non-free? Uh, because then we will have money to do some marketing or not, but the problem here is that then lots of people will not be able to actually play the game. Or should we move beyond mobile platform than as all indie devs, uh, developers are doing move to PC or console because nobody is playing indie games in uh, mobile platforms anymore. So uh, these are some of the questions and I will be happy to uh, hear your thoughts on this on this matter. Thank you. You can download the games if you want. This is the web address of all uh, devs to you. Thank you.